Both skyscrapers are on fire. The evacuations have been underway. That the United States time. on this day is under attack. The other side of the barrier. The other side. Most did what they could to escape the rain of wreckage and smoke. But others ran toward the burning buildings. Emergency first responders hoping to rescue the wounded. Hospitals throughout New York stood by. But few patients arrived. Today, the casualties from 9-11 are finally showing up. Everyone praises the dead as heroes, as they should. But there are more living suffering than dead. Detective James Zadroga. I put my gear on and jumped on the bike and uh, raced to the uh, South Tower. And, uh, you know, when I got off the Brooklyn Bridge, it was pretty bad. As soon as we hit West Side Highway, it looked like a war scene. And at that point, basically all we could hear was, you know, sirens. And I said that I'm an EMT. I should go down and help out, do whatever we can. I was set up for triage down below for kind of walking wounded as they came out. I had called my wife and I said, Laurie, something bad has happened in Royal Manhattan. I just want to call you to tell you that I'm okay. And just as I said, I'm okay, the all the lines went dead. I looked and I just saw this wall of black and gray coming at me. It knocked the wind out of me. I laid there. I had to catch my breath and trying to catch your breath. You, you, you're breathing in this black cloud. You know, at that point, you couldn't see and uh, tried to clear up my eyes. Yeah, my eyes were burning, I was coughing. Everybody was hacking and, and trying to get the stuff out of their eyes and everything because we don't know what the hell we just swallowed. You were gagging. It would be, I'd show you this rag. If I shoved it down your throat, it would be the same thing. It was, you, you vomited, violently vomited from it. When we get you into uh, Stuyvesant High School, yeah, tell them black or white. Grown men were crying in my arms, and uh, you know it was kind of it was a little difficult because I still didn't understand myself, you know, how serious it was. Mm. All I thought about was um, that I was going to die right there, and uh, how it's funny. Like I thought, I didn't think about God. I thought about how selfish I was to do what I do for a living. That now my wife is going to be a widow, and my kids are going to be. Sorry. <clears throat> that my kids were going to be orphans, you know? <laughs> the dust cloud and the dust and the... I I'll never forget the, the quietness of um, the, new the, the, the office papers just, you know, floating in the air. Three hundred and forty three firefighters and paramedics were killed in the line of duty that day in Lower Manhattan. Seventy eight police officers died, but hundreds of other uniformed men and women survived the worst attack ever suffered on American soil. At least they thought they had survived. Open. Say, uh... You couldn't stop. You'd, you'd cough for like five minutes straight. You just couldn't stop coughing. You know, you try to fight it back, and it would just come. And this is the EpiPen that I carry. If I have an asthma attack and I'm not by uh, medication, I have to jab it into my thigh so I can get some relief. I was sick 
immediately. I spent uh, three days in Jamaica Hospital after 9-11 because I kept on having asthma attack after asthma attack. Do you have your other prescriptions? Did you pick them up? Which ones? The Levoxyl. And I came home and I had a report back seven in the morning to see a police surgeon. So I just came home, I showered, and I laid down. And when I woke up, I was totally blind. In the wake of the attacks, President Bush immediately signed a major disaster declaration, activating the FRP, the Federal Response Plan. I want the entire country to know that of all of the employees at FEMA, everyone is absolutely working their hardest to do everything they can to bring all the federal resources to bear on this desperate situation. The Homeland Security Rules and Presidential Decision Directive 62 uh, mandates that the Environmental Protection Agency be the lead agency for the activities where there's a terrorist attack as it relates to environmental protection. Oh, I'm sorry. Christy Todd Whitman, the administrator of EPA, went to New York City and addressed the people there. We've had concern we're going to continue to monitor, but right now, as I will tell you, everything we're getting back from the sampling that we're doing is below background levels. There is not a reason for the general public to be concerned. It's not going to be a particular hazard unless you have breathing difficulties, heart condition, and you shouldn't be out here walking around and trying to get exercise. So that's not appropriate, obviously. Anybody with uh, half a brain would probably look at that cloud and say, this can't be good for you. But, uh, you know, unfortunately, when you're called to war, you don't say, well, I, I'm not going in there, you just go. But what exactly was in that burning pile where the World Trade Center once stood? According to final studies later published by the EPA and other government agencies, a devastating toxic soup containing more than 2,500 contaminants. Asbestos fibers, once inhaled, cannot be expelled by the lungs and cause various cancers. Benzene, another carcinogen, suppresses the immune system and can cause leukemia. Mercury is toxic to the nervous system and especially the kidneys. Lead and cadmium are toxic to the respiratory tract and can also cause irreparable kidney damage. Polycystic aromatic hydrocarbons are the chemicals in cigarettes that cause lung, laryngeal, and mouth and throat cancer. PCBs commonly cause severe skin rashes and can also cause liver damage. Tiny particulates in the dust itself lodge in the heart, causing ischemic heart disease, often fatal. You see 210 story buildings collapse and nothing's more than small little pieces. Uh, where did the asbestos go? Where did all the concrete dust go? Where did all the fiberglass go? Where did all this go? And anybody could see that it went into the air. We had seen people being dragged off that pile, you know, eyes streaming, gasping and coughing and choking for breath. We knew very well that people were being exposed to irritant materials as well as cancer-causing agents, really from the start. And probably had um, health consequences that are unlikely to have been faced in other disasters. The EPA was quick to reassure everyone that the air was safe. Like right now, we're not getting any elevated levels that indicate concern. But given the chaos of those first days, how much could the EPA have really known about the contents of that chemical soup? In the early days, it was difficult for EPA to have access. The folks who wanted to go in and set up the monitors didn't have access. There were problems with electricity. There were problems because the equipment was not available, nor were the analysts available to do the work in the first few days following the collapse of the World Trade Center. So far, we have done uh, over two dozen air samples. We're doing air monitoring, constant air monitoring. We've taken dust samples. In fact, by September 13th, the EPA had taken only 10 ambient air samples in Lower Manhattan. 
according to the EPA's own data published later. Well, if there's any good news out of all this, it's that uh, everything we've tested for, which includes asbestos, lead, and VOCs, have been below any level of concern for the general public health. Certain toxins had not been tested. There were other contaminants of potential concern, and those included PCBs, PAHs, dioxin, and I believe some other metals. You cannot find what you don't look for. Uh, this is true, and um, the agency could have done a much better job of looking. It's not a health concern. Now, it's not nice. I'm not saying this smells nice. I'm not saying this is nice. But from a real health problem, we don't have to worry. But according to a report later issued by its inspector general, the EPA's reassuring public statements that week were not based on science. They were based on White House policy. The White House, the Council on Environmental Quality, EPA, and the Occupational Safety and Health Administration worked together on the press releases. The White House had the final word. So EPA did not feel that it had ownership of those press releases. The White House Council on Environmental Quality is headed by James Connaughton, who was not a scientist. He had been appointed to his post by President Bush only months before 9-11. His previous experience? representing large corporations in disputes about cleaning toxic waste sites, working against the EPA. White House uh, Council on Environmental Quality is not on this. They're not even a part. They shouldn't have been involved at all. We were told that CEQ had a desire to protect the national security and to get Wall Street open, and that was the reason that the press releases were changed. The original title of the EPA's September 13th press release was subtitled Testing Terrorized Sites for Environmental Hazards. The subtitle after the CEQ's revisions reassures public about environmental hazards. The original draft of the EPA's September 16th press release noted several debris samples that showed levels of asbestos ranging from 2.1 to 3.3% explaining that anything above 1% is defined as asbestos-containing material. At that point, the area should have been evacuated because we had a presumed assumption of hazard, and then testing should be, have been done and people allowed back in. Instead, when the statement was released, the CEQ had changed the wording. The debris samples were now described as containing small percentages of asbestos, slightly above the 1% trigger for defining asbestos material. Our work showed that more than 25% of the samples exceeded the 1% benchmark for asbestos. That's not a health-based benchmark. In fact, an EPA expert testified after 9-11 that a half a percent can be just as dangerous as 20% this one is wonderful. This, is, this was deleted from, from the draft. The concern raised by these samples would be for the workers at the cleanup site and for those workers who might be returning to their offices on Monday, September 17th. So you take out the part where people are told that they need to be concerned. When the president visited Ground Zero on that first weekend, his message was clear. This was not a time for caution, but for action. I can hear you, the rest of the world hears you, and the people, and the people who knocked these buildings down will hear all of us soon. The president of the United States made a PR visit to Ground Zero and didn't wear his respirator, giving the false impression to the people that it was safe not to wear a respirator. President of the United States himself gave that false impression. There appeared to be a great motive to return everything back to normal as quickly as possible. Uh, particularly in the financial district. I'm looking forward to getting back to work. Do you know the conditions?
location of your office? I believe we're fine. I've been told we're fine. I live down here. I haven't been back home, but I know that it'll be fine. We're told that they have checked the air quality and that it's all right, but uh, I'm always dubious about something like that. And I'm no. hoping it's all right. I'm not happy being in the area. Ladies and gentlemen, our heroes will now open the marketplace, the green button. On September 18th, EPA Administrator Christine Whitman released a sweeping statement clearly designed to get America back to work, saying, Given the scope of the tragedy from last week, I am glad to reassure the people of New York and Washington, D.C. that their air is safe to breathe. I was horrified. We knew that she couldn't have been addressing all the irritants that were present in the air, and we knew that very little monitoring had been done at that, pre at that time. And I strongly suspected that it had economic and political motivations rather than it being based on a real concern for public health. The air quality is safe and acceptable. And um, I know there are people that are concerned about it and people that um, are worried about it, but that, that's, um, that's just the reality. If the mayor say it's okay, then I believe him, it's okay. With Wall Street open for business, others who worked in the area were expected to return to their jobs. People were brought back into contaminated areas when they should not have been. They were put at tremendous risk. And when we returned to the offices, there was dust all over the insides. There were three to five inches of dust on the window seals, and the windows were old anyway. So the dust kept seeping in, in through the windows. We were stuck with that for six months. And at the beginning of the disaster, a number of my colleagues were walking around at work, like me, wearing a heap of respirator on their face. But you can imagine trying to talk on the telephone and practice law when you're wearing one of these. I sound like Darth Vader, frankly, when I'm wearing one of these. Within months, workers in the area began to report respiratory illnesses. And they were being transferred out or relocated because they were coming down with asthma. Sometime in January, I started with the nosebleeds. And then I started to get this soreness in my chest. At this point, I have become allergic to every known antibiotic. I have had so many episodes of bronchitis and pneumonia that I am now allergic to everything. At Ground Zero, an army of workers and volunteers, over 5,000 people per day, began a cleanup process that would last for months. Below their feet, the fires continued to smolder until December of 2001. We had a slow motion incinerator that for three months burned at ground level, creating computer parts and so on into a fine aerosol the people above it were breathing. It was laughable to police officers and firefighters on that pile to say the air was safe to breathe. There was particles in the air for months after. I personally feel that once the situation had come where there were no more people to be rescued, they should have put a barbed wire fence around the entire site and then put the fires out. Why the heck was there this enormous rush to clean the site up? For heaven's sakes, make the site safe and then clean it up. I went down in the pit to, to tunnel rat and look for victims and I started, uh, su I was suffocating. And I thought, how ironic that I, I beat that building, that I survived, and, and I'm going to suffocate in this hole because I thought I was dying. I was not given a, a respirator. I don't know if anybody in my firehouse was given a respirator. If they were, they weren't working with me. We were not equipped with the proper breathing equipment. Just to start, the basic protections that you would see on a construction site or any kind of place with its materials in the air. We did not have them. And we never had the proper materials for weeks and weeks after that. I was given a respirator, I think, when I went in February. And it was cumbersome. It just got in your way. We were digging for, for bodies. We were digging, and it was hard work. 
I probably didn't wear it most of the time because they had told us that it was okay. When the White House sends a message out saying the air is clear, we tend to believe it. No one was allowed into the Pentagon cleanup without the proper respirators, without uh, washing down so there would not be air release. But in World Trade Center, it was totally opposite. People were allowed on site without any protective gear or with paper masks or with the wrong respirators and were allowed to work with their respirators off. If they had told me and told my friends and told the cops and told the iron workers, you got to wear this or you're going to die, everybody would have worn it. You'd be a fool not to. It was months before any systematic decontamination procedures were put in place. You don't leave a site without doing a vehicle washdown, uh, without assuring that you're not literally taking de contamination from the site proper and, and spreading it. There was nothing about decontamination probably till November. I remember going to eat lunch someplace and they made us walk through a bath. That really brought it home to me, like, you know, why are they decontaminating us now? You know, it's a, it's a little late for this, isn't it? And, you know, they never told you, you know, throw your clothes in the garbage, wash them, wash them separately, you know. That was it, and you know, to this day, that baffles me. I saw a couple of people walking around with uh, surgical masks and things of that sort, but I never got one. Detectives John Wolcott and Richard Volpe spent months combing through World Trade Center wreckage at the Fresh Kills landfill on Staten Island. We'd go out and with rakes and shovels and stuff and just go through all the debris looking for, you know, body parts and different things of that sort to uh, make identifications. The, the weird thing was it was very cold when we were up there. I believe it was, it was in the middle of the winter, but the ground wasn't frozen. The ground kind of like bubbled underneath your feet, which was kind of strange to me. I was like, that can't be healthy. You know, you're coughing a lot. I mean, for days after, we're coughing up blood and different things like that. After 9-11, I developed a cough, nasal congestion, congestion, burning in my ears really bad, and I really never thought about it. I went to the doctors. I tried not to go out sick. And then I went on vacation in 2004 with my family, uh, and I came back to my 40th birthday. They told me I had a mass in my chest. And I'm not crying for myself. I cry for my family because I'm worried about them being without me. I can't breathe. My throat is constantly sore. I have mercury in my system and God knows what else. And this is short term. What will happen five to ten years from now? No one knows. Detective James Adroga. I expect that the health, you know, sort of experts are really going to have a challenge to determine what's going on with these people over time. Uh, I went home and started to cut the grass. At one time, I had to actually stop and sit down and catch my breath, and I knew that wasn't good. Because I could feel that I had, like, smoke inhalation, and I coughed quite a bit, and I coughed up a lot of it, but I never felt better. Then one of my first patients, maybe the very first, was John Graham, who was a health and safety expert for the Carpenters Union and also an EMT. He had developed very severe shortness of breath, chest tightness, wheezing, a full picture of asthma that we were afraid was going to occur among these responders. He also had clear evidence of sinus problems with severe headaches, nasal congestion, facial pressure, post-nasal drip. So he had the full picture of sinusitis as well. Nice and deeply. Mouth open. Good. Slowly. In August of 2002, Dr. Stephen Levin and his colleagues at Mount Sinai Hospital launched the World Trade Center screening program. A little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. more. Well, the screening program was established really as a way to evaluate people's health status as a result of what they had done and what they had been exposed to at Ground Zero um, and to make sure that people got referred for appropriate care. 
By the time the formal screening program ended in 2004, we had seen nearly 12,000, just a few shy of 12,000. In a way, John confirmed for us all of the concerns that we had about what this responder group was at risk for. That's a lot of pills. Uh, it's progressed. The asthma and the reactive airway disease and the burns in my esophagus and lungs were initial. And now with the sinuses and the reflux and the heart are relatively new, I would say in the last three to four months. I took my medicine and I didn't have enough to eat. We're just back from the doctor and I just getting sick. I don't think that I'm going to get much better than it is today. You know, I want to try to do it whatever I can to get whatever time I have left to be the most valuable. I have uh, obstructive airway disease. Um, from what I understand, it's, it's asthma, but it's not asthma. It's not my lungs, it's my airway. After going through the Mount Sinai 9-11 uh, monitoring program, they found uh, about a half a dozen uh, nodules on my lungs, and uh, they found something on my kidney. For two years after he worked the pile, firefighter Tim Duffy avoided going to the doctor until an injury forced a visit. I knew because of my lung situation that I should stay away from them as long as possible, and I had stayed away. The fire department doctor just looked me straight in the eye and said, you're done. I said, I can go home now? And he said, no, you're done. You're never going back to the firehouse. And I was crushed. I was crushed. It, it is what it is. You take this test, your lungs are bad, you're done. They kicked me off the job. I didn't look to get off the job. You know, you try to do the right thing for your family, you know. Um, trying to build them something here that when I'm gone, you know, that she has something. I don't think I'll ever be able to go back into the workforce. I'm such a liability, I don't know anybody that'd hire me medically. One doctor in particular came out and told me that, you know, unfortunately myself and the guys that were with me that day in digging, um, we were all going to come down with some form of cancer within 10, 5, 10, 15 years and we'd all be dead. When is your surgery? Oh, we find out Thursday. Oh, okay. It's uh, about two or three times a week he goes to the doctor. I have uh, lung scarring. I have uh, growths that are getting bigger in my lungs. Uh, the beginning is emphysema. Long-term possibility is cancer. Uh, how are you feeling? Uh, considering very well. He suffers from um, pulmonary post-inflammatory bronchitis. It's a lot of scarring and um, inflammation that we think is attributable to uh, the uh, inhalation of the noxious dust. His lungs function only 60% of what we would predict for somebody his age and size. I had a blood test. Honey. Yeah, let me go get those blood tests. I was having chest pains, and I, I had it rechecked, and now I need a from perfect heart to a quadruple bypass, which I'm having in a week or two. All right, I have your blood tests. I thought that I was going to be able to tell you that your um, heart disease and your cholesterol problem is all genetic but the blood tests really don't suggest that. So it, it would really? suggest that there might be something else going on. You know, we could talk about diet, but um, I think we'll have to... Uh, I'm vegetarian. I know. <laughs> I know. I, I never smoked in my life. been a vegetarian over 30 years. Don't drink. Don't do drugs. And uh, 43, I'm having a quadruple bypass. What's causing that? And you know, where'd that come from? If you die, from being down at 9-11, of course, it's not going to be chalked up to 9-11. It's a pre-existing condition. Excuse me. I, I don't buy it. You can 
see as I'm taking it out that this is coming up. As time has gone on, I've had more symptomology, more illnesses. In 2003, I was hospitalized for three and a half weeks because they couldn't find out what was wrong with me. And they did a spinal tap to try to catch the toxins as they were moving through my system. And they weren't able to trace it. This, this is my sanity, coming out and dealing with the, the rose bushes. You know, you gotta find beauty in something because when you're in pain every day, you gotta have something to, to look forward to. I have nasal problems. I have <clears throat> uh, the asthma. I have nerve damage. I have sciatica. I have limited use of my left side. Because I'm chemically sensitive because of all the stuff I was uh, <laughs> exposed to, the toxins I was exposed to down in 9-11, I had to strip all these walls down, I had to bleach them down, ammonia, so I could put up a paint that was not going to cause me any type of reactions. And then the carpet has to be hypoallergenic and it's got special padding so the allergens don't get trapped. And here is my happy HEPA filter. It goes 24-7 because if I don't have the HEPA filter, I don't breathe too well. And the big thing with asthma at this point is it's enlarging people's hearts because when you have an asthma attack, it has to compensate for the fact that you can't breathe. So now people who have asthma down uh, at ground zero are worrying about chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which all has to do with breathing. All EMS is left in the dust, just like it's left on here. It's all dust. All of us left in the dust. One of the EPA's federal mandates is to lead cleanup efforts following a toxic disaster. But they did not take responsibility for cleaning up inside the buildings near Ground Zero until May of 2002. How can you send people back into this area, into this community, and you ain't even tested the dust that's there? Instead, the agency dispensed advice. If you go back home and you have a dusty environment, get yourself a certified asbestos um, cleanup operation to, to help you with it. Um, and if you've just got a minimal amount of dust, um, use wet mops, use wet cloths so that, you know, just in case there's anything there, you're getting it out. For the indoor air, there was some confusion. The EPA said that it did not uh, early on participate in the indoor air regulatory activities uh, because the city of New York said that it didn't want the help. Uh, that's what EPA said. The city of New York said that was wrong, that it would have accepted any help it could have gotten. There was a huge drive to reopen the building. That was all part of the general spirit of the time, which was, let's show the terrorists, let's get back up into downtown, you know, get back up on the horse. They told us they cleaned the ventilation system. Everybody goes back into the building. The media show up. Look at these brave kids. Aren't they a model for us all? And then later we find out the ventilation system was not cleaned. So the kids are inhaling deeply this toxic dust. Um, there were signs of illness very early on. There were rashes, nosebleeds, new onset asthma that can last the rest of their lives, chronic sinusitis. Some of the kids were taking uh, um, medication that included steroids, uh, and chemical bronchitis, chronic bronchitis. The list goes on and on. We know that there are people, both adults and children, who developed asthma as a result of coming back to that area too soon. We know that there are some people who are still working or living in environments that are still contaminated and this material can be resuspended into the air to cause additional health consequence. The residents who, who live near the area, who believe the government, run a high risk of health effects 20 years down the line, including cancer. The, uh, the workers already are experiencing serious health effects from working there and believing EPA and the government. 
The obvious response was to presume that the area was heavily polluted and needed to be tested and cleaned. The EPA refused to make that presumption except for one place, the EPA's offices in the area. The EPA Region 2's offices were cleaned in an entirely different way than Ground Zero was, uh, and um, frankly more protectively. EPA did want to put some statements in some of those early press releases about how to do the cleanups, but that information was deleted from the press releases, again by CEQ. Now, obviously, if the EPA treated us the way they treated themselves, they would have cleaned up first and asked questions later. Just taking some dust samples, and they sent us to a lab to analyze the asbestos, lead, and several other toxins that are out there. Joel Kupferman is co-counsel in a class action lawsuit filed by a number of residents, office workers, students, and firefighters from Lower Manhattan. The suit names Christine Todd Whitman personally, as well as other EPA officials, claiming that they allowed thousands of people to return to their homes and workplaces in Lower Manhattan with no proper cleanup having occurred. Someone that lives on 150 Franklin Street, a person named Linda Caspi, came to us saying that she's really concerned about possible asbestos contamination. She lives on the top floor, and we discovered dust right in the elevator shaft. Uh, we tested it, and we came up with 2.6% asbestos. And then the guy from EPA said, are you sure you didn't plant this here? And I said, plant it? <laughs> where would I find it? I, where would I find asbestos? You know? The Deutsche Bank building, right next to Ground Zero, was damaged beyond repair in the attacks and scheduled for demolition. Massive quantities of World Trade Center dust permeated the entire structure. Today I'm releasing documents that show extraordinary levels of contamination present in the Deutsche Bank building. It would be nothing short of criminal negligence if we do not make certain that this teardown is done correctly so that we don't risk thousands of additional cases of respiratory distress and other diseases. It's nothing you can just kind of vacuum and scrub up. So it, it's going to be a problem when they take that building down. And it's going to be just like deja vu all over again. The demolition has been indefinitely postponed. The toxic legacy of the World Trade Center remains piled inside. I got the kids with me, and I'm in uniform, and we're, we're on the higher levels, and we hear uh, the North Tower get hit, and we go over into the window and look at it, and the tower's on fire, and I'm like, oh my God, we gotta get out of here. And as we go to leave, we look, and we see the other plane coming. We go to go hit the uh, stairs, and the stairs are just packed with people, and I'm trying to hold on to my two kids, and, you know, I'm looking, things getting closer and closer, and I'm yelling at everybody, you know, I got two kids, let them through, let them through. And then I hear a loud crash. I wake up in a cold sweat. He doesn't go to sleep. He's afraid to go to sleep. He's still afraid to go to sleep. When you go to sleep, it, like I said, it's, it's like going into a haunted house, you know, a fun house. You never know what's going to jump out at you. Mm -hmm. right, it's like that falling asleep. It's like a, a waiting cat ready to pounce. Chris Bauman's bypass heart surgery has been successful, but recovery will be slow. The healing is doing fine. There's no infection. Uh, they had to crack open the sternum, remove the sternum, so that, that's got to heal. That takes uh, several months. While I was in there, I was having problems with my breathing. We actually met a specialist that's going to start looking into uh, my lung problems. And uh, I had a CAT scan done, and they had found two spots on it. So he's going to do further investigation on that once this is healed. This was August 18th of 2004. It's now 2006, and it's about $7,000 of bills that the police department never paid. <laughs> Well, right. it took four years, but they finally put me out on a uh, disability pension. I got some of my lung stuff in there. You got to fight, and 
It's like fighting for scraps from a dog, you know. Where'd you find that? I don't even know if those bills were paid. I guess when the next collection agent in St. Paul's. The, the city looks at it as a bottom line financial situation. They have to reduce their liability. That's wrong. There's no police officer that's going to stand up and say, I'm sick and deserve a pension from September 11th. It's not the cut of our character. You're not going to find this. Where? Where? What they should be doing to these police officers that come in and say they're ill is to take them in, first off, treat them with respect, but then give them the treatment that they deserve. Money takes over people. You know, that, that, that's basically what it came to with the government. You know, let's get Wall Street going, let's get the money flowing, let's get the system flowing, and, uh, you know, as people die off, oh well. Right now, I don't know. You know, everything I had planned out, everything I had drawn out that I wanted to do. I, I look to my future and I see a stop sign. I see a big stop sign. My 1199 union, I had insurance through there. Okay, this is the first cancellation of my benefits. It says it was canceled June 2nd, 2004. But if you look, the date that I got the letter was August 17th, 2004. They canceled my insurance two months prior to notifying me. They, they take it away, they give it back to me. They take it away, they give it back to me. They take it away, they give it back to me. And it's always, a, I'm tired of fighting. That's 20 grand worth of bills sitting there. That pile there is, oh, close to 10 grand. Workman's comp, you get $400 a week, and you get a check every two weeks when it shows up, if it shows up. I mean, right now, Workman's comp, um, they're two checks behind with me. I just got Social Security disability recently. That was a big fight. Everything that you try to do, whether it's an application process or, or whether it's, it's a benefit that you're entitled to, you have to fight for. You know what? I'd love to go out and work. But you know what? Physically, I can't. On the, the morning of September 14th, I was on the pile on the South Tower. I saw an enormous swatch of red, and all of a sudden I called everybody, and five or six guys came around me. As, as, as we dug further, we had, we had seen white and then a, a corner of blue with a star, and the thing was enormous. It was the actual flag that was flying on top of the towers that came down. I got a commendation from President Bush. The four-man rescue team was recognized for recovering the flag. Mike McCormick has reactive airway disease, gastroesophageal reflux, nodules on his left lung, and chronic sinusitis. But in order to receive workman's compensation, a judge needs proof that he was even there, despite his citation from President Bush. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth? Nothing but the truth, so help you God. So help my God. I was there from three hours from after the buildings went down, and I spent about two or three hours a day on the pile giving out supplies and so forth. Where did you sleep when you were down there? Down at Battery Park. In what, where, in what facility, what type of facility? In the Humvee. In terms of awards, we'll make the following findings. From October 20th, 2004 to date and continuing, the claimant will be paid at a rate of $200 per week. The claimant can be classified as having a permanent partial disability. After over a year and a half, Mike McCormick has finally won part of the workman's compensation coming to him. Others have not been so successful. Every time you go back for a review, it's three or four months. 90 days, 90 days, 90 days. Wow. It's years of 90 days. EMT technician John Graham has petitioned the workman's comp board three times. When I first started this, I was a lot more aggressive I had a lot more strength, and now I see their plan. It's kind of like, wait, they'll go away because they'll lose their strength. And what is most horrible is that so many of our patients have had to fight for a year, two years, to get treatment money in addition to wage replacement, and then when they're successful, the maximum they can get is $400 a week. I'm angry. Um, 
I'm angry that um, people can't move quicker. You know, like Social Security, come on, guys. Are you going to give it to me post-mortem? John's mounting bills forced him to rent out his home to tenants. He moved into a basement next door. The last time we spoke, mm -hmm. you had a nice house right next right. door, right? Right. I'm not really, as you can see, I'm not really that uh, needy. I can, I can live just a little place to lay my head, but it's still <coughs> very difficult. And this living situation I'm in now is not uh, any good for my health at all. It's cold, it's damp, it's unheated, it's unlit, it's... I guess it's pretty, it's close, it's close to homeless as you can get with still having a roof over your head. I'm on uh, medication to uh, lower the pressure of my kidneys. My kidneys have a tremendous amount of pressure on them and they've kind of um, imploded. Uh, they're bleeding and leaking protein and, and that kind of stuff. So. I don't want to live here. I mean, does living here make you depressed? Does being in this room make you depressed? Uh, uh, the same kind of illnesses are seen in both groups, whether they came on 9-11 itself or came, let's say, at some point in latter October to join the rescue and recovery efforts. I believe it was like six or eight months after September 11th. Basically, I was having chest pains and shortness of breath. And uh, they did blood work, and the blood work came out so bad that they thought it was a mistake. Detective Richard Volpe has contracted a rare kidney disease. Right now, I'm uh, well below 50% function in both my kidneys. Are they going to be able to do a transplant or help you? Well, they're going to, I mean, I'm going to have to be put on a list, but usually it takes about five years before they can find a donor. So I'll probably end up on dialysis before. It's irreversible, the damage. Didn't really say His partner, time. Detective John Wolcott, went to the hospital after collapsing from shortness of breath. I, I found it very weird that I was asked uh, a whole handful of questions about was I ever exposed to radiation or benzene. And I never really put two and two together until somebody at the hospital says, I don't remember being exposed to benzene. That's an airline fuel. And all that green stuff you saw bubbling out in the landfill for months, that's radiation. He's been diagnosed with leukemia. It's hard, I mean, you know, my daughter wants to, she's two years old, so she's active and she doesn't understand why I can't play with her 100% or whatever. I mean, it took seven months for me to even lift it. They're both guys in their late 30s. One has kidney failure, one has leukemia. The only thing they had in common, other than being in immensely physically good shape and health, etc., is they worked for five months together, hand in hand, at Fresh Kills. In September of 2004, David Warby filed a class action lawsuit on behalf of first responders who had fallen ill. And that has been the government response. Wait, deny, wait, deny, wait, deny. Back then, he had a few hundred clients. Today, the lawsuit includes over 8,100 police officers, firefighters, and rescue workers from 9-11, all of whom have fallen ill as a result of toiling in the toxic ruins. All of these array of blood cell cancers in the people I have who are alive and some of the people I have, have, have whom are no longer alive are statistically so overwhelming that it couldn't have been from anything else but this exposure. The suit specifically names the various companies hired by New York City to oversee the removal of 1.2 million tons of debris, claiming that more safety precautions should have been used to protect workers from the World Trade Center dust. When you have a carcinogen, such as benzene, and you have dioxin, which accelerates the carcinogen, and then you have lead and mercury, which act as immunosuppressants, all functioning at the same time, that which used to take 10 years to get in leukemia or cancer can take two years. Warby and his clients are seeking compensation and funding, not just to screen World Trade Center workers for illnesses, but to treat them as well. I think that there will be long-term health effects, everything from uh, mesothelioma, 
these uh, awful respiratory illnesses, cancers, uh, leukemia. Whoever held authority needs to be accountable <laughs> for what was not done. They told me it was safe. They told thousands of my coworkers that it was safe. And they're all sick now. And they're not helping us. Well, you're talking to a Native American. <laughs> I once said, I think uh, a few weeks after having the job, uh, I, I let it slip. I said, oh, um, I didn't know the government uh, treats all people like Indians. <laughs> in the class action suit filed against Christine Whitman by those living and working in Lower Manhattan, there has been a development. There is not a reason for the general public to be concerned. In February of 2006, Federal Judge Deborah Betts denied the former EPA administrator immunity, writing that Whitman's deliberate and misleading statements made to the press shocks the conscience. Her landmark ruling sets a precedent for holding federal officials personally responsible for making official statements that might endanger the public. All of us know that many, many people lost their lives on 9-11, yet many, many more lost their health. This is a long-term problem. Thousands are sick today, and they will probably need care for decades to come. Rescue workers in the future will be influenced by how the rescue workers were treated. If they learn that you run to a fire, and you risk your life, and you become sick, and there's no medical care for you, I, I think that's a very dangerous message to put out to the American rescue uh, volunteer and professional field. They don't want to acknowledge the sick who are living. I'm not the only one out there. Detective James Adroga. Can you welcome Joseph Adroga? Thank you. Uh, I hope I can get through this. <clears throat> I'm the father of James Adroga who was my son, but mostly he was my best friend. <clears throat> On 9-11, he arrived home to tell his wife that the towers were just struck. He told his wife, who was seven months pregnant with her child, that he had to return to work. James stated to me many times that was one of the hardest things he could ever do. But. He told her it was his job, and he had to go, and he could never live with himself if he did it. Detective James Adroga worked almost 500 hours at Ground Zero with virtually no protection. You know, a paper mask did absolutely nothing. He said within five minutes they were clogged up or he sweated, and he said half the time you couldn't even wear it. He said because it just didn't last. Uh, he, he did express one story to me that he saw uh, a lieutenant driver walk by with five masks and he, uh, respirators. And he asked her, the lieutenant if he could have one of the respirators. And the res lieutenant said, no, this is, uh, I can't give you one, this is for the brass, you know. He started to develop, as they called the World Trade Center, cough in October, which was roughly a month later. He started coughing, going to the doctor, thinking he had a, you know, cold or flu or croup or whatever. Uh, you know, he was doing nebulizer three times a day. He was a acid reflux. He had uh, stomach problems. He had throat problems. He had short-term memory loss at this time. On January 5th, 2006, Detective Zadroga succumbed to black lung disease. When I went upstairs that morning on the 5th, I saw him laying on the floor. I mean, I knew right away he was dead. As soon as I opened the door, uh, the baby was fell asleep in his room that night on the bed, watching television with him. So she was on the bed. I was on the floor with him. And the baby wakes up and said, what's the matter? And I said, your father's gone. Excuse me. James Adroga's death was widely reported as the first fatality officially linked to toxic exposure at Ground Zero. Many do not believe that he was the first, and fear he will not be the last. 
What's scary about that is that we all spent time down there. And after Felix passed away, and now Debbie, and numerous others, um, we're all pretty frightened as to who's next. We've had deaths we don't want anymore. We have sicknesses we want no more. We want the information so that we can make educated medical decisions. This is an outrage to treat people this way. Not to be able to make sure that they are taken care of, to watch their lives be disrupted, turned upside down, watch them worry about whether they're going to be able to pay the mortgage, whether they're going to be able to keep their kids in school. These people deserve better than that. Stop the lies. Please, stop lying to people. Um, I know it would have cost more money to do it differently. I know it would have cost more money, and maybe it wouldn't have been in the best interest of the security of the country to keep Wall Street closed for another couple of weeks and, and that kind of stuff, but it's not fair to kill people. Yeah, no, we were basically ignored and forgotten. I don't know. The old stand behind your president no matter what because he's the leader of your country has been changed in my mind. I, I still believe you respect the title, but you can't respect the man anymore. We're neglected. We're absolutely neglected. We are the dust that they're trying to sweep away and hope it's going to blow away. We have become the lost souls and the dust that are still left at ground zero.